Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden has taken the lead in two key states, Georgia and Pennsylvania. This Friday, Venezuela's National Electoral Council presented a new electoral schedule in the lead-up to the parliamentary elections of December 6. Turkey's foreign ministry on Wednesday slammed France's move to ban far-right group the Grey Wolves, accused of violent acts and inciting hate speech in France. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the South, and I'm Katrina Goss. Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden has taken a lead in the two key states of Georgia and Pennsylvania and according to the Associated Press remains just six electoral college votes away from victory. Biden's lead has also expanded in Nevada which offers the crucial six electoral votes he needs according to the latest ballot count report. The news came just hours after he overtook President Trump in the count in Georgia and Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania's 20 electoral votes would put Biden over the 270 threshold needed. Meanwhile, the Georgia Secretary of State said there will be a recount in the state as the margin is so close and noted that any irregularities will be investigated. Trump's re-election has become a near impossible battle, yet he continues to use social media to voice his baseless allegations of electoral fraud. Three days after one of the busiest election days in the last 120 years, US citizens still do not know who the next president will be. Republican National Committee Chairwoman Ronna McDaniel has promoted unsubstantiated claims of voting irregularities in the state of Michigan and demanded an investigation, claiming that the people counting votes were told to backdate ballots in order to skew numbers more favorably for Democrats and that any irregularities that have occurred, whether by malicious intent or incompetence, are fully investigated to the fully, fullest extent allowed under the law. Democrats are damaging the country in the process of a smooth transition of power by not allowing a transparent process. Meanwhile, crowds have gathered in McPherson Square, close to the White House, as results show Democratic candidate Joe Biden is edging closer to victory. With some 40,000 votes remaining to be counted in Pennsylvania, mainly from heavily Democratic areas, Biden opened up a 12,400 vote lead over Republican incumbent Trump, according to real-time state election results. And as mentioned, electoral authorities in the U.S. swing state of Georgia announced that a vote recount will take place as the result margin is so slim. Georgia's voting system implementation manager, Gabriel Sterling, confirmed the decision and explained that 4,169 ballots, most of them absentee ballots, remain to be counted in four counties. The state must also deal with an unknown number of ballots from military and overseas voters. Their ballots will be counted if they were postmarked by Tuesday and arrive in the mail before the end of business Friday. There are also an unknown number of provisional ballots that must be cured, either by county elections officials or, in some cases, by voters who show up to county offices and provide documentation or otherwise settle questions about their voter status. The United States has not yet fulfilled its financial obligations to the United Nations, despite the fact that 132 of the 193 UN member states have already paid their dues for the organization's 2020 operations. In mid-October, the UN called on all member states to pay their membership dues as soon as possible during the fifth committee of the 75th session of the General Assembly. UN data shows that as of September 30th, the United States, the biggest contributor to the UN budget, owes over 1.3 billion US dollars, around 73% of the total unpaid dues. The country also owes another 1.4 billion US dollars for peacekeeping expenses. In Bolivia, members of the Chief Trade Union Federation, the Bolivian Workers' Centre, announced Friday they will safeguard the inauguration of President-elect Luis Arce after the leader suffered a dynamite attack on Thursday. The Federation declared a state of emergency and called on its members to gather in La Paz on Sunday to protect the surroundings of Murillo Square, where the presidential inauguration will be held, and guarantee the safety of Luis Arce as he officially takes up the post of President of Bolivia. The attack against the president-elect occurred as far-right groups continue to perpetrate destabilizing acts and refuse to recognize the results of the October 18th general elections. 
Meanwhile, President-elect Luis Arce and his Vice President, David Chokewanka, attended an ancestral ceremony this Friday at the Temple of Tiahuanaco Ruins. The two leaders of the movement towards socialism received the symbolic staff of command of the Aymara people two days before formally assuming government. During the event, both committed themselves to govern in the interests of all Bolivians. Former guerrilla fighters and signatories of the Colombian peace agreements held a meeting with President Ivan Duque to agree on measures to stop the systematic assassinations of former combatants and social leaders in the country. During the meeting, the Colombian executive reiterated its supposed commitment to peace and noted it was deciding whether to advance the delivery of resources for the process of the political and social reincorporation to civilian life of former guerrillas. The two sides met after several demands were issued by signatories to the peace accords to address the escalating violence in the country, as well as the social crisis and a lack of guarantees that they suffer in their home territories. Before the head of state, they denounced the systematic murders of social leaders, as well as the continued presence of paramilitary groups. We have always been willing to meet. We met the day before yesterday, and in three hours we reached 100% agreement on the proposals including the visit in what the president calls home of all Colombians, Narino Presidential Palace. We see it as a great act of implementation of measures against stigmatization or the dismantling of stigmatization. It was a dialogue. It was an exchange, we would say, in that framework of civility. This Friday, Venezuela's National Electoral Council presented a new electoral schedule in the lead-up to the parliamentary elections of December 6. The presentation was held in the Center for Strategic Operations of the National Electoral Council of Venezuela and attended by the High Military Command, as well as representatives of the political organizations registered to participate in the elections. During the meeting, the Council offered a summary of the audits of the electoral machinery conducted to ensure the accuracy and transparency of the electoral process. The President of the Council assured that the electoral schedule is progressing as planned. Tropical depression Eta left 70 dead on its way through Central America, with landslides and floods causing serious damage to agricultural, livestock and industrial infrastructure. Eta hit Nicaragua as a devastating Category 4 hurricane on Tuesday, causing serious damage to the region of Biwi, where the port area practically disappeared and four people were killed. Downgraded to a tropical storm and later a tropical depression, Eta has caused destruction in Guatemala, where the president confirmed at least 50 deaths due to landslides, and around 20 people were reported as missing. Meanwhile, Honduran authorities reported at least 20 dead and serious damage to the Pacific coast. For its part, the Costa Rican government confirmed two deaths from a landslide and declared the nation in a state of alert. And Guatemala's president has announced that about 150 people have either died or remain unaccounted for due to mudslides caused by powerful storm Eta in a hard-to-reach village. At the moment, we calculate that between the dead and the missing, an official counts more or less 150 deaths. And we say unofficial because we do not have it totally confirmed. I repeat, we cannot enter Alta Vera Pass. I have many messages of my cell phone. In my emails, where they asked me to come with help, we cannot get there. We do not have any way to get there. The Cuba National Civil Defense established the informative phase for the western provinces of the country, from Pina del Rio to Cielo de Avila on Friday, due to the proximity of Tropical Depression Eta. Starting on Friday at 6 a.m. local time, those territories, including the Isle of Youth Special Municipality, must adopt the measures laid out in the disaster risk reduction plans, as well as take actions to prevent and control COVID-19. Meanwhile, Eastern Cuba must follow the information issued by the Met Institute and Civil Defense about the development of the storm. The National Civil Defense General Staff has warned of vast cloudy areas and heavy rains associated with the tropical depression, which must be observed due to the saturation of soils and the filling of dams. After achieving victory in the general elections, Ralph Gonsalves was re-elected as Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines on Thursday. According to the Electoral Office of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Unity Labour Party secured victory after obtaining nine of the 15 seats up for grabs in the single chamber parliament, which formalised a majority, and granted Gonsalves his re-election for a fifth consecutive term. Gonsalves' main contender, Goodwin Friday of the New Democratic Party, won six seats.
The Prime Minister pledged that during the next five years of his government, he will continue pushing forward social policies. So you have to like. And the Cuban and Venezuelan governments congratulated Ralph Gonsalves for his re-election as Prime Minister. The Venezuelan Foreign Ministry issued a statement saying that Venezuela welcomes the historic and unprecedented fifth victory of the Unity Labour Party, as well as the civic and democratic attitude of the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines during the elections, and reiterated its firm support to the Caribbean nation. Meanwhile, Cuban Minister of Foreign Affairs Bruno Rodriguez highlighted the relations of friendship and cooperation between the two nations. In Ecuador, the National Assembly's Commission on Oversight and Political Control approved the report recommending a political trial against Government Minister Maria Paula Romo for failure to fulfill her duties during the mobilizations against President Lenin Moreno in October 2019. Our correspondent Denise Herrera reports from Quito. With nine votes in favor, one abstention and one vote against, the National Assembly Commission approved the report that recommends the dismissal of Government Minister Maria Paula Romo due to the events that took place during the popular demonstrations in October 2019. The minister is neither the head of the police nor has authorities in terms of tactical order because in the police and in the armed forces there is the strategic order of planning and tactical order which is the execution. Therefore, I do not see that it has been demonstrated that the minister did not comply with her duties. And therefore, I do not think that we are able to prove in the conclusion and recommendation that the minister did not comply with her duties. Before the session, the minister pointed out in her Twitter account the names of the assembly members and the legislators that pushed for her political prosecution. That a minister of state comes out to give the names of the assembly members when this minister handles all the police intelligence is because she seeks to intimidate the National Assembly and to prevent the truth from being known. The minister is accused of being responsible for the excessive use of police force during the protests for allowing the use of expired tear gas bombs. She is also accused of not complying with the rules related to humanitarian actions in peace areas to be related to the use of bombs in university campus that hosted the protesters and for the late notification of the Inter-Institutional Committee for the Protection of Journalists. To seek the safety of the demonstrators is among her responsibilities. The use of expired tear gas bombs affects even the officers themselves. At the time those bombs were dropped, there are reports that other types of chemicals that are toxic to people may have been released. The report was sent to the President of the National Assembly, who will have to summon the Assembly now to deal with the trial. Denise Herrera, Telesur, Quito, Ecuador. Argentina is commemorating the 200th anniversary of the hoisting of its national flag on the Malvinas Islands for the first time, with several events nationwide, one of which was headed by President Alberto Fernandez on Friday. On this historic date, Fernandez presided over a major ceremony to hoist the Argentinian flag, an action that took place simultaneously in several municipalities of the country and was broadcast live on national television. The President will also chair the first meeting of the National Council of the Malvinas Territory, which has been occupied by the United Kingdom since 1833. The Council will propose and undertake teaching and research events that will contribute to enhancing the Argentinian population's awareness regarding the country's just demand for the full exercise of sovereignty over the islands and the surrounding maritime area. Turkey's foreign ministry on Wednesday slammed France's move to ban far-right group the Grey Wolves, accused of violent acts and inciting hate speech in France. France has argued that the group is an ultra-nationalist, militant wing of Turkey's nationalist movement party. Meanwhile, the Turkish government has denied the existence of such a movement, labelling it an imaginary formation, while the Turkish foreign ministry states that it is in any case unacceptable to ban symbols that are used widely in many countries and bearing no illegal aspects. The ministry also accused the French government of endorsing a double standard approach by tolerating associations affiliated with the Kurdistan Workers' Party and with the Armenian Secret Army for the Liberation of Armenia.
Paris's move has fueled further tensions with Ankara as the two NATO allies are already at loggerheads over a number of issues, including the Islamophobic and divisive policies of the French government. Authorities of the United Nations and the European Union have called on Israel to stop the illegal demolition of Palestinian homes. The High Representative of the European Union for Foreign Policy, Joseph Borrell, this Thursday condemned the Israeli destruction of a Bedouin village in the West Bank. The United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs in the Occupied Territories also condemned the acts and pointed out that at least 73 Palestinians, including 41 children, were displaced from a village in the Jordan Valley on Wednesday. The Israeli army has demolished more than 800 structures so far this year in order to take over new land. Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javid Sarif visited Venezuela on Thursday, where he met with President Nicolas Maduro. In an exclusive interview with Telesur, he assured that his country and Venezuela enjoy excellent relations. You have just met President Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela. What was the atmosphere of this conversation? What topics did you talk about? And how do you assess the bilateral ties between Iran and Venezuela so far? Uh, we have excellent relations between Iran and Venezuela. Uh, and the meeting with uh, President Maduro was uh, very friendly. Uh, he was very gracious uh, to receive me at his home. Uh, we had a uh, good conversation about how to further enhance bilateral relations uh, in the area of energy, uh, science and technology, uh, COVID-19, where Venezuela has made significant progress and Iran has made significant progress. And the Iranian foreign minister also referred to bilateral cooperation, especially regards the oil industry. The sabotage attack denounced by President Maduro at the Venezuela main oil refinery. I wonder if Iran isn't afraid of the risk that the collaboration and oil industry could carry to your country. I mean, will this bilateral collaboration go even further? It will, of course, go further. Uh, we have survived uh, over 40 years of this type of pressure by the United States and if we wanted to give up, we would have given up a long time ago. And finally, the Iranian foreign minister referred to his country's recent victory in the UN Security Council and noted that it represents the isolation of the United States. Iran has recently uh, won a victory at the Security Council of the United Nations. Uh, how do you receive that? Well, we, we defeated the United States three times in the Security Council uh, in the last few months, uh, and that shows how isolated U.S. policy of maximum pressure and U.S. bullying uh, has become in the international community. Uh, it's not a victory for Iran, but it's, it's a victory for international law, uh, for the United Nations Charter, and for United Nations Security Council resolution. <laughs> Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Wang Wenbing noted on Friday that China intends to continue working with African countries, whatever the risks or challenges, and forge ahead to build a community with a shared future. The remarks came in response to a query on the arrival of Chinese donated medical supplies to Africa. The medical supplies sent by the Chinese government through the Organization of African First Ladies for Development have been smoothly delivered to 53 African countries for women, children and the youth to fight COVID-19. Overcoming difficulties like restricted international logistics due to the pandemic, China managed to deliver all the medical supplies within four months. With the extensive support from the local governments and the OAFLAD, the supplies have been distributed and used in those countries. The African governments and people commended this effort and said that this assistance will better enable African women, children and youth to fight COVID-19, and that mutual assistance, solidarity and cooperation is of vital importance to winning this battle. The Director General of the World Health Organization announced an emergency appeal this Friday to drive funding towards polio and measles vaccinations, especially for children. Today, WHO and UNICEF are jointly launching an emergency appeal 
to rapidly boost measles and polio vaccination. While the world watches intently as scientists work to ensure safe and effective vaccines are developed for COVID-19, it's important to ensure that all children receive the life-saving vaccines that are already available. We estimate that 655 million US dollars is needed to address dangerous immunization gaps in children in non-GAVI eligible countries. This is a global call to action for all donors to stay the course and not to turn their backs on the poorest and most marginalized children in their hour of need. Parts of Italy returned to a coronavirus lockdown on Friday as the resurgent pandemic continues to advance across Europe. Five coronavirus red zones in Italy's north will close non-essential businesses, affecting 16 million people. Italy had been badly hit by a first wave of images of swamped hospitals, makeshift morgues and intubated patients shocking in the world. Experts said the country is now in the grip of a second wave after a sharp increase in infections. And regions are again warning that intensive care units are filling rapidly. On Thursday, another 445 new coronavirus deaths were recorded across the country, along with more than 34,000 new cases. Hospitals in Belgium are facing a record-breaking influx of patients, with dozens being transferred as the country has the highest COVID-19 infection rate in Europe and one of the highest death rates in the world. Patients infected with the COVID-19 virus are being transferred within hospital networks across provinces and now across borders as the system tries to staff off collapse. Truly Edge Hospital is maxed out to capacity and is now airlifting COVID-19 patients across the border to Germany for treatment in a desperate bid to free up space. Despite attempts to increase capacity, the hospital is transferring up to 20 patients a day by ambulance to other hospitals, provinces and other countries as all 50 beds are occupied. And we've come to the end of this news brief, but remember you can find these and many other stories on our website at tellysoenglish.net. And you can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. For Tellysoenglish, I'm Katrina Goss. Thank you for watching.